Good, good afternoon. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, one of the co-directors, together with my husband, Frank Goodyear, of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. It is a real pleasure to welcome you this evening for the kickoff of our Luc Dubois now, on view at the museum until September 4th. Organized by Matthew McClendon, curator at the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida, this exhibition represents Luc Dubois' first career retrospective, covering 15 years of his work. And consistent with the now in the title, the exhibition includes works only recently completed by the artist. Among these is 32 questions for DeRay McKesson, a new portrait of the political activist and Bowdoin alumnus. Following tonight's presentation, we hope you will join us for a public reception at the museum. The installation of Luke's work at Bowdoin reflects the work of many hands. I wish to offer special thanks to each of the exhibition lenders, to Steve, to Steve Sachs at Bitforms Gallery, to all the members of the museum's staff, in particular, Jose Ribas, Joe Haluska, Laura Lapman, Suzanne Bergeron, and Caroline Baljon. Our appreciation also extends to those individuals who generously made possible the debut of 32 questions for DeRay McKesson. A sincere thanks to Mr. McKesson himself and to the Bowdoin students who contributed questions to the interview conducted by Luc Dubois as the basis for this work. In particular, we wish to express our appreciation for the efforts of Danny Meja Cruz, president of the Bowdoin Student Government, and to Ashley Bomboka, president of the Bowdoin African American Association, for their work to solicit and compile questions from their fellow students. We thank the artist himself for his exceptional professional and personal generosity in making possible a stunning exhibition and a powerful addition to our collection. We acknowledge with gratitude the critical contributions from the following endowments. Stephen L. Frost Endowment Fund, the Elizabeth B. G. Hamlin Endowment Fund, and the Sylvia E. Ross Endowment Fund. We also extend a great thank you to everybody here at Bowdoin, in particular, Dean of Academic Affairs, Jen Scanlon, and President Clayton Rose for their support. And of course, we offer our most sincere thanks to you, our friends, supporters, and members who do so very much on behalf of our institution. As you will learn momentarily, Luc Dubois is an exceptional artist and one who blends numerous disciplines to produce works of art that give us new perspectives on ourselves and on the world around us. His work has been exhibited internationally in exhibitions and film festivals from New York to Sydney to Seoul, and has been published widely in, in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Esquire, and National Geographic. With a doctorate in musical composition from Columbia University, Luke is also the co-author of Jitter, a software suite used by numerous musicians. He appears on nearly 25 albums both individually and as part of an avant-garde electronic group, the Freight Elevator Quartet. Although well-known as an artist and musician, Luke teaches engineering and is the director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. It will thus come as no surprise that Luke uses musical and computational strategies to create sound and visual art. His work foregrounds information as a medium, much of it drawn from the ubiquitous flow of facts and figures across the internet and social media. Luke helps us to rethink the strategies we use ourselves 
to transform data into knowledge by developing new techniques, both playful and profound, to draw out meaningful and revealing patterns and observations that might otherwise escape our notice. Tonight, we are certain to be treated to many more insights from this outstanding thinker and artist. Please join me in welcoming Luc Dubois. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Um, thanks, Ann. And I really want to thank um, Ann and Frank for, for having me up here. And, um, for years of friendship and collaboration, it's really a treat to be up here at Bowdoin. And um, this is pretty informal. I'm just going to show you some things that I have kicking around on my computer that I think are interesting, and we're going to talk about them. Um, how many of y'all ever seen this movie, Desperately Seeking Susan? You know what I'm talking about? OK, this is a movie, just for those of you who have never seen this. This is a movie from 1985, uh, starring Madonna. Um, and, and one of the conceits in, in the movie, the sort of core plot line, is that um, there's, a, there's a, a, a couple that communicate through personal ads um, in the back page of The Village Voice in New York. Um, and uh, someone sort of outside that circle, right, Patricia Arquette, you know, sort of becomes obsessed with that and sort of inserts herself into this kind of romance. Um, the version of the back page of the Village Voice that exists today, though that still does exist, um, is the misconnections feed on Craigslist. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but on Craigslist, they have a personal section. And one of the, one of the better sections in it is this thing called misconnections, where you can post if you have a, roman you have a romantic encounter with someone and you, and you don't get their phone number, basically. You can write, and, and maybe they'll find it. And I have a theory that people are dumb. And that they that someone and that these people will have this encounter and one of them will post and the other person will post and they don't check, <laughs> right? And so, um, right? So, uh, so this is a piece um, that I made for Valentine's Day about five years ago that takes your local misconnections feed, grabs it all, and starts comparing ads, um, looking at the words that are in common and estimating the percentage chance that these people are talking about one another. Um, and so words like we and you and I don't really matter, but a, a name would matter or a place, and then it estimates the percentage chance. And if it um, gets above, so this isn't going to be very much, um, but if it gets above about 85%, it will email them and put them in touch. Um, so this is my, my little public service. See, 24%. So this isn't going to make it. This is Maine, by the way, so it's looking through the misconnections of Maine. Um, and, you know, and that is kind of a little bit of a, you know, sort of starting point of how I think about um, the work I do. I, um, I make uh, portraits, um, but they're kind of odd portraits. Instead of them being oil paintings of famous people, ideally on horseback with swords, um, and ideally dead, right? Um, I make things that are, that are, you know, sort of more about us and what we're looking for. Um, and just to give you some, some background in it, um, the way it all started was, um, First thing you need to know about me is, is I flunked out of engineering school. And I flunked out of engineering school because I fell in love with a machine. Um, this, this machine, in fact. Um, this is something called the RCA Mark II synthesizer. Um, and this, is, this lives um, at Columbia University in a thing that used to be called the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center, which is the oldest center for electronic music in the Western Hemisphere. It was founded in the 1950s. And it was built as part of an elaborate confidence scheme perpetrated by these three gentlemen upon the Radio Corporation of America, where these three folks, uh, this is Milton Babbitt, who is a professor of composition at uh, Princeton. This is Vladimir Usachevsky, who is a professor of composition at Columbia. Um, and this is a guy named Peter Mose, who is an engineering professor at Columbia. Um, they basically swindled R uh, RCA um, into building them this huge machine for making music by telling them that if they built this machine to their specifications, within 10 years, it would replace the symphony orchestra. And the Radio Corporation of America at the time, you know, sort of, it's sort of the iHeart radio of its day, if that makes sense, owned multiple you know, radio stations, all of which had um, very expensive unionized staff orchestras. So they sort of thought to themselves, OK, well, if these dingbats really think this will work, we'll build it. So a quarter of a million dollars later, they have this machine, a quarter of a million dollars in 1950s money. Um, 
And um, it makes four notes at once. One, two, three, four. Um, it's run with a paper tape drive, kind of like a player piano. And it makes you, your sound um, off screen, sort of over there, is a shellac record lathe. So you would like make your score on punch tape, you would run in, it would make you a record. And then you would go into the next room and listen to the record, realize you messed up, fix your paper tape. Right? If you actually know a little bit about what that means, that means it's a real time system. So the workflow implicated in this is galactically dumb because they could have just hooked it up to speakers. You don't actually need to write, the, make the record, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and this thing was like, you know, pretty cool. And, um, and, uh, and I, uh, I, took a, I took a job, not even really a job, but I, sort of a job, restoring it. Um, and it sounds like this. Let me see if I can get it to play for you. Um, RCA Mark II. Yeah, this is what it sounds like. I got about 30 seconds of sound out of it um, before it took out the power. Um, and it's still in tune after all these years. It's cool. It makes some white noise too. It can go like percussion. You can do that. Um, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, and this thing was huge, right? This thing was about the size of this room. Um, and it didn't really last very long as technology because within about five or six years, um, some uh, smart ass uh, designed something called the transistor. Um, which allowed you to shrink the whole thing. So this is a synthesizer that I used later. This is about the size of a cabinet and can do everything that that huge machine can. So I started touring with this. And um, this is something called a Bukala, um, which was built in the 1960s, mid-1960s in San Francisco. Um, and I started improvising and performing music using these machines, using these machines that kind of look like patch board, you know, uh, phone switchboards or something like that. And I thought that was cool, but there was one problem with them, which is that um, they were really temperamental. Um, and I had a band, um, which Anne alluded to, um, and this is a photo of my band. Yeah, there you go. Um, this is at the kitchen in 1999. Um, and the problem was, depend so we played this gig, I'll just tell you the story. We played this gig at this club on Bleecker Street in New York called The Elbow Room. And depending on whether the light switch was turned on in the women's room, my entire system would slow down by like a really unfortunate musical interval, like a minor ninth or something. So like, so like it would be playing and it would be like, do, 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 do. And someone would have to go pee and it would be like, -na 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 -na. so that was like not great. That was not optimal. Um, so I switched to a computer. I right, switched to a computer. Um, and, and the thing that I did um, first was I tried to make a replica of the thing that I'd been performing with, right? So, um, so just to show you what I used to do, because um, this will maybe make sense, um, I used to perform with you know, this thing called Red Panda. Um, and you can see him, right? There's his nose, and there's his eyes, and there's his ears. Um, and the, and the metaphor of the machine is, is based on drawing, so I can sort of doodle, right? I can like doodle a little shape and it'll, it'll play it for me. It's like a melody, right? Pretty cool. And there's lots of stuff that does this today. This isn't particularly novel or anything. Um, but what's kind of fun about it is I can also draw the shape of the sound, right? So I can do that, or I can grab some drums, right? And I can play that, right? And I can draw the shape that it plays the drums. Wherever you get the idea, and I can like slow it down and change key, whatever. And people would pay me to do this. It's ridiculous, but that's sort of the idea, right? Now I would improvise. Um, but the other thing we wanted to address is that this was my band. We had a cellist, and we had a didgeridoo player, because that's what you do. And we had a guy who played a bunch of drum machines, and I would play these synthesizers, and later a, a computer. And we realized pretty quickly that maybe one of the problems was we were kind of boring to watch. Um, and so we thought, well, we got a computer now, let's do something with it. And so we started integrating video into our performances. Um, and so like, if you look at this, this is me, um, and um, this is what happens. And so um, it's a little hard to tell, but this is responding to my voice. So if I talk, it sort of jumps around. And it's all based on doing this analysis. This is something called a spectrum analyzer. This is that thing on your car stereo. 
you know what I'm talking about, that bounces up and down, and, and like, you're really like stoned late at night, and you're like, that's the guitar, that one, right there, right? So like, and you, know, and you never quite know what, it, what it's for, or whatever. That's what this is. So this is showing you how loud the bass frequencies are versus the treble frequencies. And all it's doing is it's scrubbing time. It's using time as a parameter for visualization. So if something's really loud, you see now, and if it's really quiet, you see 10 seconds ago. And that's it. And so what we would do is we would take these radio controlled um, cameras, radio cameras, wireless cameras, and, and stick them inside Nerf footballs and pass them out in the audience. And then the audience would play with the footballs and they would see this, something like this on screen, right? Um, and this proved a couple things. One, one thing it proved is that um, what was happening was actually happening in real time because they weren't there. So like we couldn't have faked it. We're not up, up, up on stage playing a compact disc. Right? We're actually performing live. And it allowed them to get engaged because there's a problem. Um, you know, there's a problem with computer technology and how it's used in the arts. And it's not a problem with computers. It's, a, it's sort of a problem with us and how we perceive computers in society. Um, and it's sort of, sort of I, sorry, I don't use PowerPoint, so I just kind of write stuff. Um, but one way to think of it is, is you can think of it as a, as a problem of transparency versus opacity. In one way, a computer is completely transparent. So if you see someone, a musician, using a computer on stage, you think to yourself, I have a computer, so I know what they're doing, right? Except you don't, because the computer is also incredibly opaque. Like, they could be up there checking their email, and you have no idea, right? Um, a, a way to make this kind of a slightly smarter um, conversation is to, is to switch to French. Because um, that's what you do, um, and so these are these are two um, terms in French: jouissance and plaisir. So the, you know these are these are words that roughly cognate to joy and pleasure in English. But if you're a, if you're a native French speaker, um, they're they're quite nuanced. Um, there's a performance artist named Coco Fusco who has sort of the best, you know, kind of condensed definition of this. Um, uh, plaisir is a really nice car. Jouissance is having sex in the back of a really nice car. Right? So now you all understand the difference. Right? Um, so, um, so if you think about technology, because computers are not the only technology we have available to it, like a cello is also technology, right? Tech, you know, a cello is a jouissance item, right? Or a canvas, a painted canvas is a jouissance item. A computer is actually a plaisir item. It's, help, it's meant to help us do our taxes. Right? So the trick when you're working with computers and art is you've got you to actually jump this hurdle just to convince people that it's of the same value as what, they're traditionally, what they traditionally associate with the arts. Um, so that's sort of the thing I've been kind of hacking on for a while. And, um, and so what was my point? Oh, yeah, so here's what happened. Um, so I was working on this stuff, and I started realizing you could sort of transform a sound into an image in some way. Um, and the real kicker was this little, little trick here. I'm going to talk into my computer for a second. Um, sorry, I do this a lot. I apologize. My dog has fleas. Testing one, two, three. Okay, is this gonna work? Fleas. Hey, there Testing it is. One, two, three. Hey, look at that. Okay, this is a sonogram. My dog has fleas. Testing one, two, three. Shut up. Um, and this is a pretty normal way to visualize a sound. So that red line is time. And these are low frequencies, and these are high frequencies. And the extrusion, it's sort of like in this kind of fake 3D. So like the height of the mountains is how loud a frequency is at that point in time. Does that sort of make sense to y'all? Right? So that's sort of the idea. Um, but there's a dirty little secret in this software, which is I didn't actually record my voice. I just turned it into this picture. And so what you're hearing back Testing one is the computer three. scanning the picture. And what that lets us do is a whole my bunch of stuff that you're not supposed to do with a sound. Like, you don't have to move the red line. My dog has fleas. Or I can freeze time and play it at any speed I want. Or backwards. Right. Or I could play very fast. Or very, very fast. Like an oscillator. Um, or it's a picture. So, like, you can do Photoshop stuff. Like, I can blur it. Right? And then say, hey, what's that sound like? Right? And we blur photos all the time. But we can. Sure, groovy. Um, and I'm thinking of my, and, and so I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do with this? Um, and so if you if you if you keep in mind that the red line doesn't have to move or can move at any speed, you can start making some interesting things. And so one of the first things that I came up with um, was this, which is, um, what if I took every single number one song 
on the Billboard Hot 100 and sped it up so that it lasted one second for every week it spent at number one, right? Um, and, and so it sounds like this. Um, hey, there you go. Um, so if a song spends 10 weeks at number one, it's, it's sped up to 10 seconds. If it lasts one week at number one, it's one second. It looks like this because it lives on an old iPod. Um, and then in 37 minutes-ish, you can hear the whole history of the American pop chart, in a way, right? Because who has time to listen to all those songs, right? That's a chipmunk song. Um, and some of these are kind of fun, right? So like all of 1978's in the key of F, um, basically because the guys from the Bee Gees can only sing one note. Um, so that's kind of how that happened. Um, but if you grew up listening to pop radio, like you have part of this memorized. Like I love that song, I hated that song, I lost my virginity right there, whatever, right? This is sort of part of your cultural canon, right? And, you're, and, and it's sort of part of, part of our, our shared cultural experience of this list. And so I started making some artwork about lists, right? So the sequel to this is um, this piece, which is called Academy, and it's every, every Academy Award Best Picture in one minute. So it's 75 movies in 75 minutes. Um, this is Wings. Let me get to something y'all might recognize. That was Gone with the Wind. Hey, there you go. This is Casablanca. Um, oh, and the whole movie is in there. So it's not, I'm not skipping through the movie. I'm averaging the movie. That's an important thing, including the sound. Um, and you know, you can recognize this as Casablanca, right? right? Rick still looks like Rick. Ilsa still looks like Ilsa. Paris still looks like Paris, whatever. Um, but if you fast forward to a more n a newer film, like this is Chicago, um, this is a lot harder to read. And the reason, shut up, and the reason it's a lot harder to read it actually has nothing to do with the movie length. They're both about an hour and a half, so they're being sped up the same. It's the editing style. And that's because the average length of a cinematic shot in the 1940s was about half a minute. Now it's about six seconds, right? We edit our movies like music videos now. We're constantly panning and cutting. And so that unveils a sort of cultural ADD that's a little bit hard to notice unless you speed it up. And then to you know, round it out, I did this project, um, which is 50 years of Playboy in 50 seconds. Right? So these are all, these are all the um, Playboy Playmates of the Month, but they're eye-centered. Right? And if this were a different um, audience, we could have a really cool conversation about the heteronormative male gaze and what that means. Um, but this is, but, but to think about what these things are and what they mean, right, these, whatever you might think about this media, these are indisputably canons in the sense that um, there are books about these things. And to be part of these things means that you are perpetually on a list that's considered important. Um, and then you kind of think about how those lists get chosen. So to get a number one song, you need the collusion of several major multinational corporations, right? The people who vote for the Academy Award Best Picture are the people who are themselves eligible to win the Academy Award Best Picture, right? It's a peer review, right? We never voted for The Sound of Music, right? A bunch of directors did. Don't even get me started about Playboy, but you can see where I'm going with this, right? These are actually anti-democratic, these lists. Um, and that's kind of interesting for a democratic society. Um, after that, I started working a little bit more with, um, you know, kind of words. Uh, and so this is a project that's a lot of fun. Um, this was commissioned uh, for the um, Democratic National Convention in 2008 in Denver, Colorado. So the convention in which, um, you know, Barack Obama was nominated by his party to run as president. Um, and this was, I had about a two year jump on this project and uh, the premise of it was to do something with um, political text and to think about how to look at political text historically and from this kind of 30,000 foot view. Um, and so what they are is, is, is they're portraits of presidents, but instead of being paintings, um, they're eye charts. Like when you go to the doctor, eye charts, except instead of letters, they're words. Um, and so these are the 66 words in George Washington's State of the Union addresses that he uses more than any other president. Right? So his number one word is gentleman. Um, George Bush, who was president at the time I made this piece, his number one word was terror. Okay. Um, so um, Bill Clinton uh, spent an inordinate amount of time talking about the century in which he would no, no longer be president. Right? Or maybe his wife would be. You know? um, uh, some of these you can guess. Ronald Reagan is deficits. Right? Richard Nixon is truly. Richard Nixon is truly, for a pretty specific reason, Richard Nixon's speechwriter was a fellow named William Sapphire, um, who was an amateur linguist. And he was the first presidential speechwriter to do statistical operations 
on the speeches to figure out word counts so that he could try to game the rhetoric of his boss, right? So you've got truly an environment vision, right? Stuff like that. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson was the first president to give his State of the Union addresses on primetime television. So um, he began every paragraph with the word tonight, otherwise it would have been Vietnam. Uh, you sort of get the idea. Um, let's see what we got. You know, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation. Right, um, James Buchanan before him is slavery. If you look at these um, in situ, they look like this. They're very large light boxes. This is what they look like um, outside the Denver, uh, the Pepsi Center in Denver, which is where we had them installed. And they're to scale. So if you stand 20 feet back and you can read that line, you got 2020 vision. Right. So it's important that they're useful. Um, at the same time, I had a very nice letterpress series touring. Um, originally in Minneapolis, St. Paul during the Republican National Convention, and that's what's upstairs. Um, so that is kind of a portrait series, and it's a portrait series of the United States, but through a pretty specific lens that once I actually thought about it, I wasn't too happy with because it itself was also anti-democratic. It was sort of about the leadership, um, is what, how presidents define us, not how we define ourselves. So I started looking for a body of text um, a big body of text that um, people had written um, kicking around uh, of ordinary Americans describing themselves. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 the, and, the, and the thing I found was um, uh, online dating is one such corpus of data. Um, and so I did this project uh, where um, 2010 was a census year. Right, we do a census every 10 years. So 2010 was a census year. So I decided to make my own census. And so what I did was I joined 21 different online dating sites. Um, as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman in every zip code in America, and downloaded about 19 million people's dating profiles. Um, so about 20% um, percent of the adult single population in the United States. Um, to, I downloaded them to a hard drive and sorted them by zip code. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. This will be really clear if you haven't figured that out. Um, and so what I did was I made a census. So, so part of a census is you make maps, right? So this is where all the funny people are. Nebraska is not very funny, right? Um, this is where all the lonely people are. Lonely people tend to be um, in Appalachia. Uh, this is where all the shy people are. They tend to be in the upper Midwest. Um, this is the kinky map. So what this is telling you um, it, what this is telling you is this is telling you that men in, the southern New, in southern New Mexico need to get together with the women in Alaska. And I have this, um, I have this at this like very granular level. So like I can tell you that you know, men in the eastern half of Long Island are way more interested in being spanked than men in the western half of Long Island. <laughs> um, which I think is, is, is good stuff to know, right? Um, and, then, and then what I did was um, I made maps, you know, ordinary maps. And, um, and so, where I, where I did the same trick as the eye charts, but with cities. So I replaced the name of every city, about 20,000 cities, um, with the word people use more in their dating profiles in that city than anywhere else. So if you've ever dated anyone from Seattle, this makes perfect sense, right? So it's like heartbreak and pretty, right? And they play in a band and they fucking smoke, right? So you get the idea, right? Um, and this is this up here, this is Redmond, Washington, which is the headquarters of the Microsoft Corporation. They really have nothing to say. Um, um, and some of these you can guess. So like, uh, you know, Los Angeles is acting, right? Um, and, uh, and San Francisco is gay. Um, let's see, what are, some, what are some other good ones? Um, I grew up, where am I, where's New Jersey? Here we go, here we go. I grew up somewhere between annoying and cynical in New Jersey, <laughs> which kind of makes sense. Um, uh, you know, people, people, but some of them are a little bit more heartbreaking and thought-provoking, right? So like folks in, in Washington, D.C. will say they're interesting. People in Baltimore will say they're afraid, right? Um, folks in, uh, in New Orleans, right, will, um, will still talk about, um, if I find the New Orleans map, which is up here somewhere, there it was. Um, people in New Orleans will um, still talk about the flood, right? But people up in Baton Rouge say they're curvy, right? So you sort of get the idea. Madison, Wisconsin is pierced. Good college town. Um, Banger, Maine is waitress. Um, New York City's number one word overall is now, as in now I am working as a waiter, but actually I'm an actor. Um, but if you go down to the zip code level, um, you can see some stuff. Like I live somewhere between unconditional and midsummer in Manhattan. Um, this is gentrified North Brooklyn. So you've got words like glamorous and hipsters and narcissistic and hoodie and you know whatever. Um, so this is called a more perfect union. 
Um, and this was a project, you know, about trying to use this kind of big data strategy to make a portrait about ourselves. Um, and then I have a sort of personal one that kind of rounds out the trio, which is this, which is all my email. Um, this is a self-portrait. This is uh, what you call a quantified selfie. Um, so what I did was I took all my email. I I've sent about half a million emails in the last 20 years um, and ran it through some stuff. And uh, what it is is it's a physics equation. It's something called a force-directed graph, which is all the latest and greatest in data visualization because you can be lazy and you don't have to label the axes. But, but the basic idea is you have to imagine there was a big bang right here. Um, and everybody I've ever talked to, everybody I've ever written with, flies out at like kind of a random angle, right? Um, but then everybody has gravity to one another. And, and you have gravity based on carbon copies, you know, so like who's talking to who that I know about. And the gravity is based on how much you've been emailing, how long you've been emailing. But it also does sentiment analysis. So if I say I love you, you're heavier, okay, um, to me. And so um, my email addresses over the years kind of scatter in the middle, like kind of a mainline star system. And if you zoom right in, you see all the people who are closest to me, right? Um, and I hand wrote all the names. Um, so it's a big print, and it's upstairs. Um, and you can also, you know, use it as a way to kind of look at who's associated with who, and why, and how, and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of interesting. Um, and you know, it's a way to, it's a way to make a self-portrait these days. Um, not all of these things that I make are, uh, that's my Facebook one, it's kind of the same deal. Um, not all the things that I make are, are, are necessarily um, quite as fun or funny. Um, so I'll just show you a couple other little projects, and then I'll um, show you DeRay and talk you through it. Um, so, uh, like, an example would be this. This is a portrait I did. This is actually how I met um, the good years, how I met Anne and Frank, um, was um, uh, I brought this down to the National Portrait Gallery um, to pitch it to them. This is a portrait I did of Britney Spears. Um, and there's a story behind this. This is a good story. Um, in 2002, um, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, the people who brought you the internet, um, had this design challenge. They, they set this competition up um, in 2000, early 2002 to engineering schools around the, around the United States, including my own, saying, hey, we got this problem. If we give you a bunch of videotape, any old videotape, unsorted, we're not going to tell you anything about it, unsorted, unlabeled, you don't know where it's from, you don't know why, you don't know how long, can you find us one specific person in that videotape? So in 2002, you can imagine who they were looking for. Right? Um, and they didn't actually find him that way, which I think is interesting. But the winning team, which is out of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, right? largest public engineering school in the United States, um, came up with this um, algorithm, this thing called a modified hard cascade that works pretty effectively if you have enough um, training data, if you can put in enough known photographs of the person you're looking for, it works pretty well. So what I did was I, I trained it on the one person who you never need to surveil that way which is Britney Spears. So I downloaded 2,000 paparazzi photos of Britney Spears and taught my computer to find her and her alone and lock her eyes. Um, and so what this is, this is all her music videos with her eyes centered and the frame panning around. Because, you know, we got this really funny double standard, right, about surveillance in society, right? We really hate being surveilled, the idea of being surveilled, but then we surveil celebrities all the time. So I thought that was kind of a, a thing to try to comment on. Um, this, is a, this is a newish project um, that's a little bit um, tricky to describe, but it's, it works. Um, this, is a, this is a Walter PPK, a uh, 9mm semi-automatic handgun uh, that was used in a shooting in the French Quarter in New Orleans um, two Valentine's days ago in an argument over parking. Those are my cigarettes. Um, this is the house where the shooting took place. Uh, this is some barbecue I ate. Um, this is a hardware store I had to go to like 15 times to find the fucking hard to find drawer. <laughs> Just, I was like, really? Um, I need a grommet. Um, this is, so this is an Internet of Things piece. Um, the Internet of Things, which is sometimes called connected devices, which is a better title. Um, but the idea that like, you know, you can have um, something on a network control a physical device. This is an Internet of Things piece. Um, so you take the gun and you, and you weld it um, to a big steel plate. And then you go home and then you get attacked by a rooster. Anyway, um, and then um, what you do is you build this mechanism. And this mechanism is a bike chain rigged as a camshaft that's dri driven by a little stepper motor that's controlled by a computer. And you bury that mechanism 
mechanism in a box and run a little wire up from the box around the trigger of the gun. And then what you do is you um, put the um, device into a little gallery and what you do is you put the computer online and you have it listed in the 911 feed of the police department of um, the city you're in so that um, anytime there's a shooting reported, um, it fires. Okay, right? This is called data visualization, right? We call this data visualization, right? And when you do it right, it's illuminating. When you do it wrong, it's anesthetizing. It's an important point about data visualization. So there's a bullet, sorry, there's a blank. So there's no bullet, but there's a cartridge right about here. And so there's about six shootings a day in New Orleans. So this filled up, right? This filled up. And this is, and this project's called Take a Bullet for the City. This was in um, the Public Library in Ferguson, Missouri. It's going to Chicago in a little while. Um, and this is a thing that I've sort of has been on my mind because we are starting to do things that I think are bad um, with data. Um, for example, we are putting bar graphs on newspapers when we should be putting photographs on newspapers, right? So when we're talking about, um, you know, a tragedy, right? And we're starting to illuminate it with a line chart instead of an image. And that makes us basically start thinking about people as numbers, right? Um, an earlier piece that I did in that kind of same vein uh, was a string quartet um, called Hard Data that was about this very topic um, as lensed on um, the Iraq war. So this is a string quartet. Um, have you guys ever heard of a guy named Yanis Zanakis? X E N A. Yeah, okay, so one, at least one person. So Zanakis was a composer, um, Greek composer, uh, lived most of his later life in France. Um, and he, the most important thing you to need to, there's two important things to know about him. One is he was an architect first, he was um, Corbusier's assistant. But the other thing about him is he, was a, he fought as a partisan um, in, the, in the Second World War in Greece against the, against the Germans. Um, and he had this whole thing about um, writing music to try to make it sound like war. And the way he did it was he delineated between sort of strategy and tactics. So he would write music that had very clear formal lines, sort of like a general watching the armies across the battlefield. But then the details of the music were done stochastically. They were created by a computer running a random number generator. So the individual notes we're like the soldier in the battlefield. Everything is effectively random. And so this is a piece that I did where I took the um, casualty stream of the Iraq war. All the dead men, all the dead children, all the dead soldiers, all the people who made refugees, all the dead women, all the people who's gone missing, and scored it as a string quartet. And so there's, you know, one measure of music a month. And if 30 people get killed that month, the string quartet has to play 30 notes, right? So the arc of the music follows the arc of the conflict. Um, and people will tell you that, uh, that, that doing art with data is new, right? That didn't exist before like 1973. But the truth of the matter is, we've been doing it for 40,000 years and this is it. It's called music. And if you think about what music is, music, if you take the working definition of music as like something time-based with sound and maybe instruments and throw that out, what music really is, is music is a manipulation of data to make you feel something. Right? And so that's what everything I do is, it's music. Um, and so I was thinking about this, you know, this piece. And I was also thinking about this piece because of the, you know, the commission that I did for this show um, is based on a really interesting guy. Um, and I just want to show it to you for two seconds and then you guys can ask me questions and we can go upstairs and look at it. Um, Duray McKesson is a Bowdoin alum who, um, if you don't know much about him, is a, is a fascinating character. He um, after his time here, he uh, uh, was a Teach for America fellow and then took a job eventually um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul um, as an administrator, uh, sort of human resources administrator in the public school system. Um, and when um, Mike Brown was, was shot dead in Ferguson, uh, he uh, had insomnia watching TV and got in his car and went down there initially as an observer just to see what the protests were. And then he was tear gassed and he became an activist. Um, and he's a pretty interesting guy. And one of the things that's interesting about him is he uses Twitter a heck of a lot. He's got something like 150,000 tweets. He's got something like 325,000 followers. And so the way this project worked um, was uh, we crowdsourced an interview with the help of um, some of the students here, put together an, a slate of interview questions, 32 in all, 
I filmed um, him in New York and had my students, down at NYU Engineering, deliver the questions. And then as he speaks, these are topics that are relevant to um, the conversation. And over here are, is a, it's cut off, I apologize, but it's a real-time feed of his Twitter in response to those topics. So if he's talking in a clip about race, you'll see a, a random sampling of his recent Twitter activity talking about race. So the video never changes. The video changes a little, but the corpus of video never changes. But the data that you see on top of it will always change and will never go away. Is, right? We'll never, we'll never become out of date. Right? Like this, is, this is not the America I know. It, it can be different. I'm going to do whatever I can to, to make this a different world. Show you yeah, so the movement is bigger than any one person, bigger than any one organization. The movement was started by the people. The people came outside and said enough is enough. And that is so powerful because it's a reminder that you are enough to start a movement. When I think about the biggest change is that the movement has created space for a national conversation about recent policing in ways that we had not seen before. And that space opened up even greater space for a conversation about the complexity of black identity we, the conversations at the national stage around the trans community are, are happening in ways that did not happen before publicly. Um, and most importantly, the movement, largely because of social media, has redefined the public sphere. It opened up so much space for people to talk about things and be in community in ways that we had not imagined before. And that is powerful. You guys get the idea. Um, so it's about 45 minutes, right? And it just kind of loops. Um, you all should ask me some questions, and then we can go upstairs and look at some stuff. That was a lot of stuff, sorry. I have other stuff, too. I make movies, you know, whatever. But, um, but yeah, but ask, me, ask me some questions if you want. Everybody's like, what was that? I have no idea. I don't even know what that was. All right. There's a mic, if anybody wants to use a mic. Yeah, talk to me. You finish saying something along the lines of um, we should be doing bar graphs, we should be putting pictures. And I know you're doing our like, series of animals, mm -hmm. which are basically bar graphs. Yeah. And you started off by telling us that you think that people are stupid, you know, that you know, we're just putting out these messages, you know, about trying to find somebody, but we're not reading anything. And um, gosh, it's Well, no, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't really usually give talks like that, but I, the, the thing about the misconnections, sort of using stupid as a joke, but I do think that we don't, and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, I don't think we read, I don't think we pay enough attention to the words that are being put in front of us. Does that make sense? So, like, one of the things, like, with that Iraq war piece, like, one of, one of the, the, the string quartet, right? Like, one of the things that, I noticed in the Iraq war was that was a conflict that we were fighting where more of us had data than knowledge. Does that make sense to you? So like under, un, unlike the Vietnam War where you still had a public draft, right, we have an all-volunteer military, but we're being bombarded with a 24-hour news cycle. And so we can recite like numbers of casualties and how much money is being spent, but most of us don't actually know anyone fighting, right? Um, and that's a bad Rubicon to cross because that leads to all sorts of like really kind of misguided policy decisions because people don't feel it, don't, don't, actually, under, don't actually have like lived experience understanding of what the downside of these decisions can be. Does that make sense? So like a little bit, it's not that, it's not that I'm trying to be mean to a specific audience, it's more that I'm trying to do this work to kind of get people to actually think about it. So like the heartbreaking thing with the gun piece, right, is when you go into a gallery to see it, part of you wants it to go off, right? But that means somebody's getting shot somewhere, right? But part of you wants it to go off. Everyone has to admit that to themselves, right? And that's, that's the danger of the data visualization thing, right? That, that like the bar graph always goes up and part of us kind of wants it to. Right. I don't know, uh, because you're, you're talking about how we can sort of humanize him. Mm -hmm. uh, and you sort of going between rhetoric and, and discourse. And, um, you know, you have, you're talking about, you made a sort of moral judgment about just basically saying that people can't understand, you know, the entire society. You can't understand the community, but all we can understand is one individual data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm not sure I believe it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's interesting because, you know, that one of the things that I think about a lot, um, so here's the thing. This isn't science, right? This is art, right? So it has the same relationship to science that science fiction does to science, right? So part of it is about I'm showing these things not so that, like, you can look up your zip code in a dating map and find out where your word is, more about just so you see all the words and start asking yourself questions about like how, how is it we talk about ourselves in this way? Do you know what I mean? And I apologize for the tone if that's, if that's inappropriate, but the, the part of the way in which I try to convey these things is I think about, I think a lot about, a, a, I think a lot about information as, um, you know, something that we don't have a, a super tight literacy on yet. Like there's more, there's more of it than we know how to handle. And that runs the gamut from me having like 40,000 unread messages in my inbox and just not having my shit together on it, to, um, you know, us being fed stuff, you know, in the national media based on statistics without understanding the provenance of those statistics. Right? So like a good example of this is, is, is the way in which um, the word average is used in the media. Have you ever noticed this? So like, um, you know, when people say something like, you know, the average something, like the, like, the aver like the average income of the United States, right? Depending on, so there's sort of three common statistical ways to delineate average, right? You can have the, the median, right? Which is just you add up everybody, divide how many people are, right? You've got, sorry, that's a mean. You've got the median, which is you find the split point where half of the people are below and above, and then you have the mode, which is sort of the largest statistical slice, right? And so people on the political right will tend to quote the mean. People on the political left will tend to quote the median, because this makes us a richer country. This makes us a poorer country. Social sciences, scientists will usually quote the mode. And that kind of thing is prevalent all over the place, and it's something that's used so casually um, in journalism um, and in editorial writing that we just sort of take it as like gospel without actually thinking where those numbers come from. Does that kind of make sense? So like I think about that stuff a lot and it like stresses me out, <laughs> right? It, like, you know, it kind of it kind of like, you know what I'm saying? It like stresses me out that like, you know, and, and, and it's not, and, it, and, and everybody's guilty of this, right? So like when I read New York Times editorials, like I want to tear my hair out because they don't, they're not like, they're not fucking sourcing their data correctly, or to my satisfaction, they're not, they're not, you know, so they're not really telling you where those numbers are coming from. And so that's why I play with them, right, and try to make these pieces that are based on these words. Yeah. What else, folks? Yeah, Ann, what's up? Luke, one of the things that I find um, so fascinating and exciting about your work is precisely that I see it as the intersection of um, many different disciplines. I think it's, from my standpoint, really exciting to see a musician playing with the visual and applying some of the computational dynamics of music making to mm -hmm. analyzing pictorial information. And for me, it provides a way to rethink some of the conventions through which we understand information. And it, for me, it gives me the, the um, at least the, the, the sensation that maybe I'm more aware of the conventions that are usually invisible to mm -hmm. me. Um, so that is very exciting. But another thing that I find incredibly um, uh, intriguing about your career is that your day job, um, mm -hmm. so to speak, is being an engineer. Well, and, being an engineering professor, and, and which is know, not the same thing. And, <laughs> so I know that one of the things you focus on um, as somebody who thinks about engineering is the whole question of um, disability, yeah. which then has this flip side of access. And so I wondered if you might be able to load. say 
a little bit about why it matters that you are a creative practitioner who also is charged with solving quote unquote practical sorts of problems. And if you could say a little bit about the intersection between um, the arts and engineering from the standpoint sure. of creative practice, um, but also problem solving. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, well, this is like a false, you know, so there's like the, there's a false dialectic set up in education, right, between um, the idea that artists ask questions and engineers solve problems. Um, and that they're not actually supposed to talk to one another, <laughs> um, which is something that maybe you don't experience at this school necessarily, but it's something that um, every institution I've taught at has been sort of set up as a given and it's a drag. Um, and so what I do, I I've, I've sort of have a job where I run a digital media program at an engineering school, um, which means that my students are looking at the intersection of engineering and, crea and creative practice. But it is not per se an art program. And so a lot of what we look at are um, ways in which creative solutions present themselves to engineering problems. And, and one, of those, um, one of those spaces is, um, is, is things like assistive technology and adaptive design for persons with disabilities. So this is one of the labs. Uh, this is the lab that, I'm, that I run at my school. And it's, and it's called the Ability Lab. And a lot of it is about um, teaching engineering students about client-centered and human-centered design. Um, so um, the undergraduate disability studies class that we run, it's taught by a colleague of mine named Alan Goldstein, um, is a, you know, sort of like superficially an ordinary disability studies class. You read books and you watch movies and you discuss, but you also do a client-centered design project with, um, uh, with that we do in collaboration with United Cerebral Palsy. So we have two engineering students um, working with a client, um, working with an adult living with cerebral palsy, their first job is to make a documentary film about that person, right, which teaches them empathy and it also teaches them some storytelling skills and teaches them how to talk about um, and talk with this person. Uh, and then they do a design um, intervention, right? They build them something. And so that, so that engineering students are taken out of this space that invention in health is something that you get FDA approval on and you patent the shit out of and you make a million dollars. Instead, it's all about, you know, this is Steve. Steve can move two fingers on his left hand. Steve needs an umbrella. Build Steve an umbrella. Right? Do your job. Right? That's what an engineer is supposed to do. Um, and so that's kind of where we work. Um, and we do a lot of uh, um, interesting projects. I work with um, a population at, the, um, at NYU's Hospital for Joint Disease um, looking at stroke rehabilitation. Um, looking at how to use consumer level technology, things like the Microsoft Xbox, like video game controllers, to allow people to take their therapy regimens into the home so they can do stuff that normally has to be done at a clinical site with an occupational therapist for an hour a week, and they can do it every day in their house for a couple hours. So you sort of gamify health that way. Um, yeah, so we do a lot of that stuff. I mean, that's my day job. That's, you know, that's what pays the bills, it's fun. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so that's sort of the space in which I work professionally. Um, and then the, you know, the creative stuff is also in there too. Yeah, yeah, talk to me. Well, I, I guess it's more of a comment than a, than a question. But um, it seems to me that when an artist uses big data, mm -hmm that it allows us to zoom out on our uh, patterns, mm -hmm. our cultural patterns. And to me, that's a really valuable thing because when you're, when you're in the pattern and looking at it from the street level, uh, you don't really see it as a pattern. And when you zoom out, you, you, know, you get a completely different perspective. And so I'm really interested and excited to see you know, what you have upstairs and mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. They call it, you know, you ever heard this term apophenia? It's kind of like a little, so somebody who sees patterns where there aren't any, right? So I, I have a little bit of apophenia, which leads, which leads to like sort of conspiracy theories pretty quickly, right? Because I see stuff that I'm pretty sure is all connected, right? And I'm like, I'm like, well, clearly, you know, the interstate system is exactly based on the canyons of Mars. 
because I can see it. Like, it's obvious, you know? And, like, I start, and so I start doing, like, stupid shit, right? Because I start, like, you know, associating things wrong. But, yeah. Um, but sometimes it works. Sometimes it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, talk to me. Any of Any y'all. Do you think the average person walking in to see an exhibit of yours gets it? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's a good problem. You know, so that's a that's sure. Um, yeah, may I just explain? I'm, I'm thinking of the little girl in the Vietnam War who, who was on fire. You know, mm -hmm. you have an emotional response mm -hmm. to that. And how do you have an emotional? Re how do you even understand or and or have an emotional response to this? So um, there's some things that are a little bit more clinical than others. What I didn't show you, which are all upstairs, is, is I also make a lot of films and a lot of projects around cultural placemaking in the United States. And so you'll see when you go upstairs, like there's, uh, there's, five, there's five pieces that are portraits of, of retired American circus performers. And they're beautiful. They're all shot in 240 frame a second slow motion. They're set up as kind of fictive circus posters, like 19th century circus posters, but they move. Um, there's a film that I did in 2007 that's a 72-hour film shoot of a woman getting ready for a night out on the town in slow motion. But it's sped up to 72 minutes, and she's in full public view. She's out in the city. She's outside doing it. Um, those pieces, I have a marching band performance that I did in New Orleans in 2011 where 350 high school kids march around. Those things you know, elicit or are intended to elicit some kind of emotional response. Um, the stuff I show you today is more framed around the kind of big data stuff. And it's more, those things are more like talking rather than feeling pieces, right? So the eye charts, right, what, what tends to happen is it's like a history lesson, right? And so um, once somebody knows the system, right, there's like a text on the wall that kind of explains what it is. And once people know the system, then like you can talk about it a lot because, you know, the older you are, the more of those eye charts you know. Right, the more you remember, right? So when I walk around with my father, my father was born in 1930, right? So he understands, you know, the good good part of the 20th century in depth and can look at words like seven lines down, right? And say like, oh, I know where that that came from. I know why Harry Truman said that, right? Because I remember this, you know. And that stuff does that make sense? So like, it's less about like feeling and more about like uh, an act of memory or an act of conversation, right? Um, for those things, you bet. Um, but there's some things where I, where I want you to feel something for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the gun thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. What else, folks? Here, talk to me. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. It's interesting work. Thanks. Uh, I, the, the term science fiction was brought up, and, and I, I started, and then you went on and uh, were talking about uh, your work as an engineer, mm -hmm. and it seems like you do a lot of um, uh, good social work uh, with the ideas and helping people. Uh, but when you talk about your work, it, uh, there seems to be, it seems to be driven by a deep cynicism. <laughs> Uh, so that when, 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 when the term science fiction is brought up, I was just kind of curious. Uh, how do you see um, your work? Do you see it uh, in a utopian manner or dystopian manner? Um, I uh, have an extraordinary amount of faith in um, people, not necessarily myself, but people, um, many of whom are subjects of my portraits, right? Um, but I do have, it's not like I have a cynicism, but it's it's... Um, I, I choose as subjects things that aren't necessarily like the most fun, right? So like one thing if you look at the, if you look like sort of um, over time at the presidential eye charts, right? It's like you go from like gentleman to terror and 43 easy steps, right? And that's, you know, it took in a certain context, that's actually like a really kind of heartbreaking trajectory, right? Um, so same idea with, um, you'll see them upstairs, but like uh, the circus portraits and like the stuff I did with marching bands. And I did a big project with the William S. Burroughs Estate in, in Lawrence, Kansas two years ago. And a lot of that stuff is about cultural placemaking and, and pushing back against homogeneity in American culture, right? That we have all these beautiful points 
of very important culture in this country that are effectively endangered, right? So like marching bands in New Orleans have been effectively gutted by the post-Katrina fiscal situation in the school system in New Orleans, and that's a cultural lifeblood for that city, right? The American circus is, is in sort of irreparable decline, right? We don't go to see it anymore. We'd rather go to the movies, right? And some of that's about animal rights, but some of that's also just about the decline of the performing arts in general, right? We go to the movies more than we go to see live theater or live dance, right? The only bright spot is kind of stand-up comedy, actually, is sort of perpetually on the rise. Um, you know, and the same thing is like, you know, we no longer have time for the eccentric beat poet, right, living in Kansas either, right? And that, that stuff, it's not like I'm cynical about it, but it's more like I notice it and it kind of ticks me off. It makes me upset, right? It makes me angry. Um, and it makes me angry that my students today don't know who any of those people are. They never played in a marching band, they never, because, you know, performing arts programs in the New York City public school system are gutted too. Never played in a marching band, they've never been to, been to the circus and they've, you know, never read On the Road, they've never read Naked Lunch, they've never read, John, you know, like they don't even know what the hell that shit is, right? So, um, and that, like, and there's millions of examples before, does that make sense? So, like, it kind of stresses me out. I wish I could be more utopian. Um, and in some space. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a thing, right? So that so like when you you know when you yeah. No, it is. I mean, and it's weird, but you know, when when we I don't even have my ring on me, but you know, when you when you join an uh, an engineering society, a national engineering, right, you take an oath. It's kind of a little bit like a Hippocratic oath when you become a doctor, right? You say like, you know, I swear I will use all of my power and all of my knowledge and all of my skill for the betterment of humankind, right? And it doesn't say what that power, knowledge, or skill is, and it doesn't say which slice of humanity you're going to help. So, um, so that's where that comes from. Um, and so that's sort of a little bit why that's the way my day job works. But, um, but at the same time, a lot of that is about, I have a cynicism underwritten in that too about like sort of making sure that engineering students understand the ethics of what they're doing, right? That, uh, that my department, the people I teach with, are the only people standing between them and the military industrial complex, right? We're the only people standing and saying, you know, there's something, there's something you can do where you'll still get a job and you'll still make money, right? That might be better than designing, you know, you know, radar guided missile systems, right? And you might make that choice. And there's a lot of help that needs to be done. There. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, so that's part of it, you know. Um, but the advocacy and the activism is 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 part of the day job and the night job too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, either of you guys. I'm searching for um, a way to get at what I'm feeling. The implication of some comments is that using big data is somehow dehumanizing. And to me, and you made a distinction between the more emotional pictures or images that you use that draw an emotional response as opposed to the talking sorts of things. I find that talking also profoundly humanizing in the sense that it shows us who we are as human beings in our contemporary, fast-paced, word-oriented, mm -hmm. tweet-oriented culture. Right. Right. It, it, in a way, it, it's a portrait of what it is to be human in our particular society, obsessed with these 41-character ways of communicating. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the thing. I always think we're running out of time. That's another thing that I've got kind of going on. So I, um, you know, so I worry about that. But yeah, I mean, I was, um, how was I? When I was nine, yeah, I was nine. I asked my father for a bike, and he bought me a computer. Um, and it was a really weird story, because my father was in this really anti-bike mood, because my sister's 10-speed had just gotten stolen. So he tried to talk me out of wanting a bike with some, like, really complicated multivariate word equation. He was like, okay, so say a bike costs 20 bucks. It costs you 20 cents to ride the bus. How many times would you have to ride the bus 
but take your bike. Like the whole thing didn't even make any sense. And eventually I was like, okay, fuck it, Pop. I don't want the bike anymore. Um, and so he bought me a computer. And so we actually, for a long time, I thought, the bike, I thought a computer cost 20 bucks. Because I, I thought those were like economically equivalent gifts. Like I really didn't understand it. Um, and, uh, and he bought me a computer and, and I taught myself how to program. Um, uh, and one of the reasons I taught myself how to program was I was having like a really hard time um, like expressing myself to other people. Um, and this is like one of the things, you know, and you're absolutely right, sir, like to say, you know, it's like I have a, I have a social interface that's, good, that's kind of very blunt, right? And so one of the ways in which that's challenging or that's been challenging in my whole life is the, you know, is the way I interact with people is a little bit of a show, right? Because I, I have a hard time, uh, growing up, I just had a hard time kind of like thinking through um, it's almost like an empathy problem. It's not exactly it's not exactly Asperger's or autism or anything like that. But it's like I don't um, I, I I I am ceaselessly aware of what's going on in my brain. And so when I vocalize things, it's like I'm almost just like excerpting a slice of it while everything keeps running. It's almost like a river, right? And I apologize for that because that's how it comes out. But the computer, right, didn't give a shit, right? The computer just let me do it. It would just do what I told it to do, right? And that was like really empowering. You know what I mean? And like, and when I was, um, and that was sort of like one thing. But the other thing is, you know, I, I didn't grow up in this country. I grew up overseas, which I probably should have mentioned earlier. Um, so when I was when I was 11, my parents took me out of the country. I grew up in I grew up in the in the United Kingdom. I grew up in London, and then uh, my parents lived in Tokyo. Um, I spent um, a chunk of eighth grade in the Soviet Union. Um, I lived kind of all over the place, and so I also I grew up foreign. And so when I came back to the United States, I'm an American citizen, but I, can't, I, I really didn't live here until I was 17. Um, and that means I have a slightly funky understanding of how this all works, right? Um, that's, that is borderline anthropological, which is one of the reasons why sometimes it's easy to take offense at, because I'm sort of studying us, trying to figure out how I'm supposed to act as one of you. Does that make sense? Um, so that's a, that's a sort of minor, you know, confession in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, sir. You've been like, you've had your like hand raised like for the whole time. Um, talk to me. Beauty? <laughs> so this guy, Dan Cameron, he's a buddy of mine, he's a curator, once paid me this amazing backhanded compliment where he said that the best thing about me and the worst thing about me is I have a complete disregard for visual style. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, I mean, I do think about beauty. I think about, um, and I also think about how beauty can make you feel things that are abstract. I mean, really, that's the essence of music, right? You can have something that's beautiful that's kind of upsetting, right? That's part of the part part of the musical vocabulary is knowing how to shock and how to um, how to make somebody cry, right? And all that kind of stuff. So these are like sort of negative emotions associated with positive things. Um, so I do think about that. And in the cinema work I do, I think a lot about visual aesthetics and what looks good and what doesn't. Um, I'm not talking about visual aesthetics. You're just talking about beauty? I'm talking about beauty more of a philosophical. Hmm. Like, like, like truth and beauty? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I think. I think about it sometimes. Um, I think about uh, I think about the. Be I used to be like a more of like way more of like a math geek than I am now. So I used to think about a lot about like the beauty of numbers, right? Um, that kind of stuff. And that's really where like the cynicism creeps in actually, is because I was really, really, really into um, musical systems and mathematical systems that make music. And at a certain point, I realized that those things in no way, shape, or form had any social relevance. Um, and that kind of like broke my thought process on that. And that's when I kind of fell down a little bit of a more postmodern rabbit hole and started looking at like media and mass media and information theory and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, I think like 15 years ago, I would have thought a lot more about beauty, right? I was, I was doing a lot more visual work that was based on music and formal systems of music. Does that make sense? So yeah, I mean, I think about it. I have to come up with a better answer for you. No one's ever asked me that in my life. So, yeah. Anyway. If, if, Should we go upstairs? If I may, I, 
We should I go upstairs. I can't think of a more beautiful note to end on for um, an art exhibition. And so you've been hearing so much about this work. This has been a spectacular presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You should go see the show.